In June of 1914, the heir apparent to the Austrian crown was assassinated by a Serbian nationalist in Bosnia. In retaliation, Austria invaded. This triggered a declaration of war by Serbia's ally Russia, but Austria was given an assurance of military support from the German Empire. The subsequent German declaration of war against Russia triggered a somewhat unenthusiastic alliance between Russia and France, leading Germany to attempt to invade France through Belgium, which then brought Belgium's ally Britain into the conflict. This was it. A hundred years after Napoleon, World War had finally returned. Though the Ottoman Empire officially remained neutral at the outset of the war, the three pashas at the head of the empire's ruling dictatorship had made no secret of their love for Imperial Germany, and just four days into the conflict signed a secret treaty promising to enter the war as a German ally. Even before doing so, the activities of the Jewish community in Palestine, the Yishuv, had come under intense scrutiny and regulation. And when the Ottomans did formally enter the war, Navy Minister Ahmed Jamal Pasha took military command of the Palestine Front and began taking action. Of the 85,000 Jews living in Palestine at the time, fewer than a third were Ottoman citizens. A majority, in fact, were nationals, though not citizens, of the Russian Empire, a country with which the Ottomans were now at war. For obvious reasons, most of these Jews had come to Palestine fleeing the Russian government. But under Jamal Pasha's guidance, their Russian nationality provided a convenient excuse to eliminate a population he viewed as antithetical to Turkish racial supremacy. Despite initial promises to provide opportunities for naturalization, Jamal Pasha issued an order that December that any Jew who had not already obtained citizenship would be arrested and deported, either to internment camps in Anatolia or to British-occupied Egypt via neutral vessels. The cities of Palestine were plunged into chaos. Like many others, 34-year-old Yosef Trumpeldor chose not to wait, voluntarily fleeing to Egypt on the neutral American ship USS Tennessee. Upon his arrival, he found a new sense of purpose. Trumpeldor was a man eternally at war with himself. Once a pacifist, he had willfully served Russia in the war against Japan in order to prove the bravery of the Jewish people. In the process, he had given up his left arm, his freedom, his hope for the future of Russia, and his ability to live with peace. In 1906, he turned down the chance to become Russia's first Jewish military officer in decades, and by the time he left the country, Jews had become banned from the officer corps. Left to his own devices in Palestine, Trumpeldor was a depressed, angry, womanizing control freak. But in Alexandria, he found comfort once again in military matters. While some of his contemporaries maintained the hope that Ottoman authorities would eventually see reason and ally with the Zionist cause, Trumpeldor saw the situation in Palestine for what it was, the last gasp of a dying empire, just like his native Russia. As long as the Jewish people yearned for democracy, they had to look to Britain and France as their champions. And if Trumpeldor was ever to return to his adopted home, it would not be as a citizen of the Ottoman Empire, but as an officer of the British Empire. He wasn't alone. By March of 1915, 11,000 Jews from Palestine had arrived in Alexandria. Of those 11,000, 1,200 mostly young men without families, could be found in British-run refugee camps, where discussion quickly turned to the liberation of Palestine from Ottoman rule. On the 3rd of March, an informal committee of Jewish refugees and foreign Jewish businessmen met to discuss the situation, spearheaded by Trumpeldor and one Vladimir Jabotinsky, the recently expelled representative of the Zionist organization in Constantinople. It is impossible to sit here with folded arms and subsist on charity. On the other hand, there is no doubt that sooner or later the British will march on Palestine. The news from Jaffa is dismal. The talks have forbidden Hebrew science. Although he is German-born, they have deported Dr. Atorupin. Mayor Dizengoff and other Jewish leaders have been arrested. It has been decreed to prohibit Jewish immigration after the war. Well then, after some debate, 
the committee agreed to present their fellow refugees with a petition to the occupying British military to authorize the creation of a dedicated Palestinian Jewish fighting force. For General John Maxwell, head of Egyptian command for the British Army, this petition was no surprise, and he welcomed it with open arms. Not only was he aware of the goings-on in Alexandria, but British military leadership had been having their own debates about creating a Jewish military force. The propaganda value of raising a Jewish army against their Ottoman oppressors was self-evident, but there were serious challenges for putting such a proposal into practice. So on the 15th of March, Maxwell made the best offer that he could at the time. I have heard nothing of an offense against Palestine, and I doubt whether such an offensive will be launched at all. Also, the law doesn't admit foreign soldiers into the British army. I can only make one suggestion, that your young men enlist in a mule transport unit for some other sector of the Turkish front. I cannot do more than that. That evening, the refugee committee led by Jabotinsky firmly rejected Maxwell's offer. But Trumpeldor, the only member of the committee to have actually served in combat, stood firm that it was not the business of military leadership to cater to their whims. To get the Turks out of Palestine, we've got to smash the Turk. On which front you begin is a matter of tactics. Any front leads to Zion. Respected as he may have been, Trumpeldor couldn't rally support for the proposed Mule Corps on his own. But astonishingly, just as Maxwell and the refugees had reached an impasse, a man arrived in Egypt who, though not Jewish himself, was uniquely capable of winning Jewish hearts and minds. Born in Ireland in 1867, Lieutenant Colonel John Henry Patterson was something of a celebrity. He'd first come to prominence in 1898, when he spent several months hunting a pair of lions known as the Ghost and the Darkness who'd been killing and eating railway workers in the Tsavo region of East Africa. By sheer coincidence, Patterson also happened to be the British Army's foremost expert in Jewish history, a fascination of his since childhood. Because Patterson was an Irish Protestant, I've seen some casual insinuations that his philo-Semitism was rooted in esoteric religious beliefs. But by all accounts, his interest in the Jewish world was wholly sincere and largely secular in nature, and this would prove indispensable upon his arrival in Egypt. When General Maxwell appointed Patterson to the leadership of what was then being called the Assyrian Jewish Refugee Mule Corps, he was totally unaware of Patterson's background in Jewish studies. But Patterson knew exactly what to do. As soon as he arrived in Alexandria, he began making contacts with the leaders of the city's Jewish community. Not the refugees, but the local Jewish leadership. This was all about building trust. At the same time, Trumpeldor organized a rally for the Mule Corps at the Mafruza refugee camp, which included speeches by several British officials. But it was Patterson who proved most crucial, declaring for all to hear, The soldier who carries ammunition and supplies to the trenches fires no less courage than the man who fires a rifle. Patterson's comments belied a far more radical view of modern warfare than that of his colleagues, and rightly so. Following the publication of his East African memoir, Patterson went on a tour of the United States as a guest of President Theodore Roosevelt. While there, he visited U.S. Army bases and studied the tactics of the American Civil War. While European military thought had scarcely evolved since the time of Napoleon, the Americans had more experience than anyone else with the realities of mechanized, attritional warfare, which European observers had dismissed at their own peril. In these days, war is robbed of all its glory and romance. It is now but a dike-maker's job, and a dirty one at that. But much as the soldier may dislike this method of warfare, it has come to stay, and we must make the best of a bad job, adapt ourselves to the new conditions, and by sticking it out as we have always done, Wear down the foe. Even before the First World War, Patterson was convinced that the traditional distinction between combat and non-combat units was meaningless in the face of total war. Every unit was potentially a combat unit, every soldier a rifleman. Accordingly, he ensured that the newly dubbed Zion Mule Corps would be fully armed. On the 23rd of March, the Jewish volunteers marched to the Gabari refugee camp, where Chief Rabbi Raphael de la Pergola officiated the swearing-in of the Zion Mule Corps, with Colonel Patterson as CO and a now Captain Trumpledore as his deputy. But their struggle to reach the front was far from over. 
For a brief time, the Russian consul in Alexandria attempted to have the Jewish volunteers repatriated to serve in the Russian army. At the same time, the same military regulations that kept non-British subjects out of combat roles also strictly limited their participation in support roles to no more than 2% of whichever army corps they were attached to, limiting the poorly named Zion Mule Corps to an active roster of just 500 men. This was only a fraction of those who had volunteered, though many subsequently made their way to the Western Front. Among them was Vladimir Jabotinsky, who henceforth began a fruitless lobbying campaign to establish a dedicated Jewish combat force in France. Of greatest concern, however, was that Patterson had only three weeks to train the men before their deployment. Upon their inspection, Mediterranean Commander-in-Chief Sir Ian Hamilton was thoroughly impressed with what the ZMC had been able to achieve in such a short time though his impression was unquestionably colored by some genteel anti-Semitism. Incidentally, both Hamilton and Patterson repeatedly referred to the ZMC as the first all-Jewish military unit of the modern era, and this is something you'll hear repeated even today. But longtime fans of this channel will know that this wasn't the case at all, as dedicated Jewish units had served in the Kosciuszko Uprising, the November Uprising, and the American Civil War. I just wanted to set the record straight. On the 30th of March, the ZMC gathered for the Passover Seder. Colonel Patterson, who'd worked hard to ensure the provision of kosher ingredients for the dinner, addressed his men. Pray with me that I should not only, as Moses, behold Canaan from afar, but be divinely permitted to lead you into the Promised Land. In reality, it would be years before they saw Palestine. Instead, the Zion Mule Corps would be part of a gargantuan effort to strike the very heart of the Ottoman Empire. Even before the Zion Mule Corps came into being, the Gallipoli Campaign had already begun. Since Ottoman entry into the war, essential shipping between Russia and the other Entente powers had been cut off by the Germans in the Baltic and the Ottomans in the Black Sea. It may have been possible to re-establish Entente supply lines through neutral Persia, or even to assist the Russians by way of the Pacific, but a direct attack on the Dardanelles, the 50-kilometer strait connecting the Black and Mediterranean seas, offered a far quicker route. If successful, such an attack would also expose the Ottoman capital Constantinople to occupation, entice neutral Greece and Bulgaria to join the Entente, and likely force the Ottomans out of the war entirely. An attack on the Dardanelles was also attractive because of its perceived cost, both in money and manpower. With the British and French armies largely committed to the Western Front, the Gallipoli Campaign was able to make use of older naval vessels which had been rendered obsolete in the fight against Germany. So on the 17th of February, First Lord of the Admiralty Winston Churchill authorized a bombardment of Turkish fortifications on the Gallipoli Peninsula. Churchill had hoped that the Navy and Marines could force their way through the Dardanelles on their own. But despite the apparent destruction of stationary Ottoman coastal defenses, he had underestimated the size and mobility of the Ottoman ground forces. Escalation was necessary, at sea and on land. This is what the Zion Mule Corps had been training for. In addition to the ZMC, Egypt was swarming with military activity as newly assembled forces from Britain, France, and eight British colonies and protectorates trained intensely for the coming invasion, an amphibious assault on a scale never seen before. In April, the British and French occupied a number of Greek islands as a staging ground, and on the 25th, the landings began. Now, if you're at all familiar with the Gallipoli campaign, it's probably through the viewpoint of the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, or ANZAC because this was the first time that Australian and New Zealand forces were put at the forefront of a major battle, which significantly increased nationalistic feeling in those two countries. However, the Anzacs didn't constitute the main attack. After landing on the Aegean coast, in an area now called Anzac Cove, their objective was to push inland and cut off the Ottoman defenders from the north. The bulk of the Entente forces, however, concentrated on the southern end of the peninsula, with British and colonial divisions disembarking at Cape Helles, while the French staged a diversionary landing on the Asian side of the strait before joining the main invasion force. At the outset of the battle, the Zion Mule Corps was divided in half, with two companies serving at Cape Helles under Patterson, and two companies assigned to the Anzacs under Lieutenant Shlomo Zlotnik. Without Patterson to vouch for them, 
Zlotnick and his men came to a sorry end. The Australians and New Zealanders largely welcomed the muleteers. Those two countries had actually been the first in the world to have Jewish prime ministers. 7,000 of the Anzacs themselves were Jewish, including some of the highest-ranking officers. But their British commanders weren't so kind. When an additional unit of muleteers arrived at Anzac Cove in mid-May, the ZMC contingent was ordered to hand over their mules and return to Alexandria, where upon their arrival they were forbidden from disembarking, leading to a mutiny and the dissolution of their companies. Of the 300 men sent to Anzac Cove, only half remained in service afterward, the rest having been killed in action, arrested, or demobilized. Someone hadn't wanted them there. The muleteers at Cape Helles, meanwhile, became the stuff of legend. On the 27th of April, Colonel Patterson and Captain Trumpledore led their men ashore at V Beach. Delayed for over 48 hours by an enormous traffic jam created by the initial landings, the ZMC found themselves in impossibly high demand. Over three straight days, the men shuttled much-needed water and ammunition. Hampered all the way by incessant enemy gunfire, the torrential rainfall of a late winter storm, and the terrified stumbling of the animals. For only having had three weeks training, the men of the Zion Mule Corps were irreproachable. The actual mules, on the other hand... As April gave way to May, the ZMC experienced their first fatalities, though their initial casualty rate was surprisingly low under the circumstances. To hear Colonel Patterson say it, the ZMC were the only transport unit in their sector for most of the spring and summer. During rainy nights, their missions would often unwittingly take them across their own trenches and into no man's land, placing themselves under enemy and friendly fire. On one occasion, a ZMC soldier was nearly executed for espionage by his French allies when they heard him speaking Hebrew and mistook it for Turkish. And whenever in need of assistance from the ZMC, Captain Arthur Berend, a Jewish officer in the East Lancashire Regiment, would often find them calmly drinking tea around the fire while Turkish artillery bombarded everything around them, showing a curious disregard for shell fire. Captain Trumpledore was well known for using artillery barrages as an opportunity to write love letters to his many mistresses. On the 6th of May, the British began their second attempt to capture the village of Krithia, and it was here where, just as Patterson had predicted, circumstances forced the Zion Mule Corps to take on a combat role. Initially dispatched to the trenches to resupply the Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers, the muleteers found the frontline forces so devastated by casualties that they couldn't possibly mount an offense against the Ottoman line. Instead, Corporal Eli Hildesheim entreated his fellow muleteers to take up the fusiliers' position and overrun the Turks themselves, which they did. Though the ZMC officially remained barred from combat service, no commander in the British 29th Division would dare suggest that they had done anything wrong. The Zion Mule Corps subsequently took on a combat role at the Third Battle of Krithia, where Captain Trumpledore was wounded in the left shoulder just inches from where he'd lost his arm in the Russo-Japanese War 11 years earlier. At 2.15pm, the rifle and shell fire grew more intense. Suddenly, one of our men came riding up, crying out that a man was wounded. I rode off to the spot, and when all this was done, mounted my horse to ride back when I felt as if someone had given me a hearty blow on the left shoulder. The stars on my epaulet tinkled, and I thought the bullet had knocked it off. When I arrived at the camp, I took off my tunic, and to everyone's surprise, it turned out the bullet had passed through almost the entire thickness of my shoulder, and was sticking out on the other side. Finally, the doctor took a good grip of the bullet and began to twist as if he were drawing a cork out of a bottle. Then the bullet came out. The ZMC took on combat duties once again at the Battle of the Gully Ravine, and while they continued to perform an indispensable supply role, remember, they were the only transport unit in their sector, all pretense of being a non-combat unit had quietly disappeared. Patterson had been right about this war. By this time, news of the ZMC's bravery had reached the ears of Jamal Pasha. Incensed by the existence of a high-profile force of Palestinian Jews fighting for the Entente, he forced the remaining Jewish population in Palestine to take loyalty oaths denouncing the British and organize a patriotic pro-Ottoman rally in Jerusalem. But as Jamal Pasha also continued to escalate his campaign of terror and hate against the community, their sympathy for the British only grew. Unfortunately, 
No amount of discontent across the Ottoman line could change the fact that the Gallipoli campaign was failing. The lines of battle had barely moved in three months. As ever, the size and capacity of the Turkish forces had been underestimated. By the end of July, combat and disease had produced casualties in equal numbers, and the Entente forces had lost a significant amount of strength. The British war office under Lord Kitchener had been loath to invest additional resources on Gallipoli that could be better used as cannon fodder on the Western Front. But by this time, it could no longer be ignored, and Kitchener authorized the deployment of an additional 10 divisions as well as a wave of replacement troops for the units already there. The Zion Mule Corps had been no exception to these problems. The mistreatment of Zlotnik's contingent at Anzac Cove and the steady buildup of casualties in the effort to take Krithia had reduced the ZMC to half of its original strength. There were also morale issues. At the same time ZMC troops were graduating to combat, Patterson and Trumpeldor clashed wildly over leadership styles, with Trumpeldor threatening mutiny. In late August, as reinforcements began to arrive, Patterson and Trumpeldor returned to Egypt to recruit two fresh companies of the ZMC. But they faced a strong backlash, particularly from the wives of fallen muleteers who had thus far been denied widows' pensions by the British War Office. Indeed, Patterson would spend much of the rest of the war, and many years after, fighting the British government over the issue of pensions, only securing pensions for widows in 1923 after threatening to take the issue to the Houses of Parliament. But in the moment, the two officers were able to collect an additional 200 volunteers and redouble their efforts on the front. Back on the battlefield, the British successfully achieved a third landing at Suvla Bay, which was able to join up with the Anzacs to form a continuous front in the north of the peninsula. But this left the Allies no closer to opening up the Dardanelles. The initial two fronts showed no progress whatsoever. And as the Mediterranean summer dragged into September, conditions in the trenches only deteriorated further. In late September, French ground forces withdrew from Gallipoli, leading some high-ranking British officers to propose doing the same. But General Hamilton refused on the grounds of the damage it might cause to British prestige. The arrival of winter only worsened conditions still, with gales, heavy rain, and even the improbable snowstorm. It was during the snowstorm that Hamilton received a new order from the cabinet in London. He had been overruled. Gallipoli would be evacuated. That New Year's Eve, Trumpledor announced to his men in Hebrew, We are leaving tonight. Our work is done. We have a right to say well done. We and the Jewish people need never be ashamed of the Zion Mule Corps. In truth, the evacuation would take over a week during which time the ZMC paid tribute to the 14 men who had been killed in action, as well as 2nd Lieutenant Alex Gorodisky, who died of illness while en route back to Alexandria. Those mules who had fallen ill and couldn't be evacuated were killed so as not to fall into Ottoman hands. A large contingent of the ZMC were nearly killed themselves when their transport ship was torpedoed and sank. Captain Trumpledor was the last of the muleteers to evacuate in the final hours of the 9th of January. And just like that, the Gallipoli campaign was over. The ZMC arrived in Alexandria the following day, their fate unclear. In late April, the Easter Rising erupted in Ireland, and at least one company of the muleteers was ordered to transfer there and suppress the rebellion. In a stunning act of insubordination, they refused, arguing that their agreement with General Maxwell had been to fight the Ottomans not to take up arms against Irish patriots, with whom many of them sympathized. With the Sinai front as quiet as ever, and still no indication of plans for an offensive there, the Zion Mule Corps was officially disbanded, parting ways on the 26th of May, 1916. During the final days of Gallipoli, Colonel Patterson had fallen gravely ill, and spent the next several months recovering in London. In 1915, he'd fought constantly against the prejudice of his fellow high-ranking officers to even keep the Zion Mule Corps in existence. But in 1916, he now received plaudits from around the world, from officers who had witnessed the bravery of the ZMC firsthand, and from friends in high places like former U.S. President Teddy Roosevelt and Jewish territorialist leader Israel Zangwill. 
but by far his most enthusiastic correspondent was Vladimir Jabotinsky, whose lobbying efforts to create a Jewish combat force had never ceased. By this time, the brutality of the war had depressed enlistment so severely that the British Parliament had to institute conscription for the first time ever. Such was the demand for officers that men from the working classes were even getting temporary battlefield commissions. But as Secretary of State for War, Lord Kitchener remained opposed to the loosening of restrictions on foreign volunteers, and bitterly opposed to Jabotinsky's proposal. In early June, just a few days after the dissolution of the ZMC, Jabotinsky visited Patterson in the hospital to give him the latest news. How is your plan progressing? Lord Kitchener is against it. Realities are stronger than Lord Kitchener. Will you help me? Of course. They had no idea. That Monday, Lord Kitchener was killed, his ship sunk by a German torpedo. The very same day, Prince Faisal of Hejaz commenced an Arab revolt against the Ottomans. The road to Palestine was open. Special thanks to my patrons, including Mir Akbar Ali, Jeremy Biskin, Boris Cherney, F.C., Matthew Feinberg, Jay Fleischman, Osher Gordon, Bob Huddy, Raphael Kellerman, Jacob Kossoff, Robinson Crusoe, Eric Lederman, Jeffrey Schweitzer, and Ian York.